Uh, and uh, finally, as a Russian, this is no democracy in this room. This is, you know, these are my rules. And uh, please observe them, and I will cut short anyone who will be really uh, uh, willing to do some lengthy presentations or comments, whatever. Thank you. So now we're going to start. So the issue is the digital, the digital society at stake, the future of uh, Internet in Europe. We will start, we will start in, an, in the alphabetical order. So uh, I guess, Christina, that's you. Thank you. Three minutes. Thank you and uh, good morning everyone. Um, I would start by saying that um, in general we need broadly supported principles as they help finding and defining a European uh, dimension and finding common ground then at global level. Um, the European Commission has recently outlined its vision in its communication on internet governance and policy adopted in February this year and which is now being discussed uh, by the European Parliament and the Council. The communication contains the main elements of our contribution to the global debate on these issues. In it, we reaffirm our approach that only in a world where the Internet is firmly anchored in the defense of human rights and democratic values, and where the same values and rights that apply offline are also protected online, can we all be uh, net beneficiaries of the digital revolution. And European Commissioner, uh, Vice President Kurz, clearly stated that fundamental uh, freedoms and human rights are not negotiable. We also firmly support a real multi-stakeholder model with the full involvement of all relevant actors and organizations. And uh, I think that now, after years of standstill, there is now a window of opportunity in front of us as Europeans. We should use the momentum generated in Net Mundial and by the recent announcement of the US government on the IANA transition to produce real um, changes. And the Commission has called on all stakeholders to do their bit. You heard it in the, in the video message of the, of the Commissioner. So now to the real question of our debate today. What is uh, at stake? I see two main um, sides uh, to this problem. On the one hand, we are witness of a changing uh, global political landscape where there are more and more active emerging powers. Many of them are pushing for new governance structures and reject multi-stakeholder approaches. On the other hand, the multi-stakeholder model clearly needs to be improved and strengthened. It must be based on clear rules to defend fundamental rights uh, and democratic values. And on top of this, the revelations of surveillance programs and cybercrime have negatively affected trust in the Internet. All these elements together put at risk the stability of the Internet ecosystem. And indeed, ensuring security and stability of the Internet is in a way our number one priority because we can talk about freedom of expression and freedom of information, but first we need to ensure the ability to access information. If you lose physical connectivity, if there is a failure in the system for whatever reason, then you have a real problem, especially in society like ours, which are now heavily dependent on ICTs. All the, um, and then there is also the risk of building new walls to fragment the internet along national borders, depriving us of the benefit of the internet. This seems anachronistic, but the risk is real, and maybe uh, the other panelists from the technical community will be able uh, to confirm this. And excuse of course, me. excuse me, time. Yes, this Thank will you. be bad for, for companies. Yeah. So in our view, no, sorry, Rike. Okay, sorry. I told you, no democracy. Please, you got a, you, okay, you got a mic. Please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to speak to two points. The first is the the vision or the the. the the peculiarity that Europe can bring to the global internet governance debate and then some concrete proposals. First, I think one of the strengths of, of Europe in the, in the internet governance debates at global level is really our human rights system. We have one of the strongest uh, regional human rights systems in the world, including the European Court of Human Rights and, it ca and its case law. We have two um, regional organizations, both the Council of Europe and the European uh, Union, the European Commission, that has done tremendous work in this field. From Council of Europe, we, have, we both have legally binding documents and we have a number of standard setting documents. Uh, also, most recently, we have a guide on human rights for internet users. 
At EU level, as most of you are aware, we have a number of policies in this field. We have the data protection regime, um, and we have pretty strong uh, positions on internet governance. So I think as someone who has participated in, in the global debate on these issues for a long time, I think it's really time that Europe step up and really join the forces we have on human rights from Council of Europe, from the European Commission, and bring these agendas much stronger forward. What could that mean in concrete terms? One concrete proposal could be that the two bodies, to a much larger extent, strategize and develop policies together in the global processes. One concrete proposal could, for instance, be that internet governance mechanisms, such as ICANN, ICAN, undergo human rights impact assessment, which means, at a very concrete level, that rules and procedures related to internet governance are subject to assessments of their human rights impact, their human rights compliance, including recommendations on how various aspects of their rules and procedures uh, can be strengthened. Another concrete proposal uh, could be to uh, enhance and focus specifically on access to remedies for internet users, uh, internet users in Europe, but also, of course, worldwide. Access to remedies is a fundamental part of international human rights law, but as we all know, there are a number of challenges related to actually enforcing those rights. So that could be a second point. Excuse me, time. So who's next? Uh, uh, I guess uh, Axel? Yeah, your turn. All right. Um, so to come back to what uh, Christina said, what's, what's, the, what's at stake for the internet? I think basically it's, it's the internet as we know it, Jim. That, that is open, that is functional, that is safe, and that's what we, what we all have to work to. And when I hear Europe, and yes, this is Eurodic, but the RIPE NCC service region goes a little bit further than that. Um, it, it goes into the Middle East and parts of Central Asia, as we say. Um, what we did over the last 25 years, before I was at RIPE and, and at, at RIPE as well, is build trust, do outreach, and when we built the internet, or what, what it became <clears throat> in the beginning, it was engineers talking to each other, and the goal was to make this thing function. Uh, and so there's implicit trust in that. In the beginning, on, on the one dimension, we, we went into the regions, went, went east, and uh, as, as RIPE NCC, as RIPE community, we went into, into Russia, into, in, into the Middle East as well, and helped establish local communities that, that can engage on a local level, on a, on a regional level. And that now brings me to, to multi-stakeholderism, where we say multi-stakeholder is sort of a, a great idea, but it's open to interpretation here and there. What we would like to say is the way we work is open, it's transparent and inclusive. So yes, when we started as, as engineers 25 years ago, it was already multi-stakeholder. We didn't know the word yet. Um, and nobody cared. So it was just the engineers, but it still was open and, and inclusive. And suddenly, about 10 years ago, we heard that, oh, the, in the, the, the governments are interested in talking about the Internet. Oh, that is scary. So we started to, to reach out and engage and try to build trust and, and help understanding of each other's issues and, and, and concepts, uh, concept of misconceptions also. When I sat in one room with uh, four FBI agents saying, you, I want you to call back those address ranges, I said, no, this is not how it works. I cannot do this, and I'm not sure that I should do this. But let's talk about what your needs are and, and, and how our community functions, how the technology functions. And I think that is essential, that, that we go and talk to, to each other and, and governments and regulators. We have roundtables that, that we use to engage with, with governments and regulators. We have once a year a meeting that we, that we do uh, with law enforcement agencies from around the world and with you know, participation from the other regions as well. That is important, the, the, the goodwill, the going out and the trying to, to understand what the other's positions are and how we can play to them. Thank you. That's it. Uh, Jörg, your turn. Right, I think first thing I would like to point out that for me we are not talking about a certain part, the digital of our society. I think at least in the developed countries we are talking about society as a whole. Because 
in a way, we are connected. We are part of the internet, even though we might not be online right now or an active user. Just think about mobile phones, for example, think about smart meters, or just think about somebody posting a picture with you on it. So basically, at least in Europe, I would like to stress there is no such thing as an isolated digital society, but it's society as a whole we are discussing about. And societies, for sure, they do need laws, they need rules and principles, but as the net has become such a vital part of our social, economic, and political life, influence in governing the net <coughs> is sought across a broad, broad variety of groups, like <coughs> governments, civil society, and business, and for sure, each of them with very different interests amongst them, and even within certain parts of those groups. So what could the solution be? The solution could be that we can either come up with an agreed upon set of values and build laws and rules on those which are globally effectuated and enforced. And I think this is very much unlikely or likely to be incomprehensive. Or we could just accept certain islands resulting in contentions like protecting or escaping those islands, think about filtering for example, or to counter what is coming from those islands, think about malware. Or we could try to unite a group as large as possible, Europe for example, to agree on values, put them into action, enforce them, and just hope to persuade those islands just by setting a working example. Thank so you. you. Time. Europe sorry. being a sorry, nucleus sorry, of sorry. rough consensus. Robert? Thank you very much. Give me a microphone. Give me a microphone, please, if it's possible. Добрый день, уважаемые друзья. Я не женщина, к сожалению, не представитель гражданского общества, но я попробую внести немного перца в нашу дискуссию, потому что мы можем все уснуть. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry, I'm not a woman. I'm not a civil society representative, but I'm going to bring in my uh, spice into the discussion. Otherwise, we're going to fall asleep. Если мы говорим о будущем интернета, то, на мой взгляд, его нет. Internet, Во всяком случае, в смысле того глобального пространства, которое мы имеем сегодня. Uh, Это связано с тем, что uh, сегодня любая страна сама определяет, каким образом она регулирует uh, сеть и взаимоотношения в сети. It has to do with the fact that every country today defines on its own how to govern this space. У нас практически отсутствует международное право в этой области. International law in this area is non-existent. Я не знаю, может быть, кто-то видит слона в этой комнате. I don't know how it is possible to see an elephant in this room. Я вижу слона в этой комнате, этот слон спрашивает у нас, прошло полтора года с тех пор, как Сноуден сделал свое разоблачение, что изменилось? Я знаю, что не изменилось ничего. И я знаю, что все мы с вами по-прежнему под колпаком. И... На мой взгляд, ну, например, было сказано, что Мутнет Мундиаль это самое прозрачное и самое прекрасное мероприятие на Земле. На мой взгляд, это самое непрозрачное мероприятие на Земле, потому что только я и мои коллеги отправили больше ста комментариев, ни одно из которых не было учтено. I think it was the less uh, transparent event so far because uh, I and my colleagues sent out uh, 10 comments and didn't receive any feedback. На мой взгляд, это имитация процесса принятия решений. Это замена действительно тому, что необходимо. 
I think it's a kind of imitation, a simulation of a way to make decision in terms of what we really need. Я как вы являюсь прихожанином церкви мультистейкхолдеризма. Uh, I, like uh, many of you, uh, go belong to the church of multi-stakeholderism. Но я не верю в магию. Я не верю, что если мы все вместе будем сто раз говорить мультистейкхолдеризм, мультистейкхолдеризм, он внезапно настанет и будет прозрачность и права человека и верховенство права. But I don't believe in fairy tales. Uh, no matter how often you say multi-stakeholderism, multi-stakeholderism, it won't happen. Я считаю, что мы должны создать правовую основу взаимоотношений в сети. И это самое важное на сегодняшний день, то, что мы должны реализовать в рамках, например, Совета Европы. I think the most urgent task for today for us is to lay down the legal framework for internet government through uh, uh, Council of Europe. Мы должны сделать все для того, чтобы у каждого стейкхолдера было правовое основание для действий, которые он осуществляет. We need to do everything to give each uh, stakeholder a legal right, a legal status to do uh, uh, whatever he or she needs in the uh, и для этого мы сейчас в комиссии парламентской ассамблеи Совета Европы, в комиссии по образованию, медиа, науке готовим доклад о том, чтобы обобщить лучшие практики, которые существуют на пространстве Совета Европы. That's why at the moment we are working at the uh, Education Media uh, Commission with the PAC on uh, a special report on the uh, best practice practices that are available in this area for today. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Well, Thomas, any comments from you? It's okay. I think uh, Lorenzo oh, is Lorenzo. Yeah. But before, Lorenzo, you start, let me tell you that I'm a little bit disappointed. Where is the digital society at stake, the issue? which we uh, put as a title, where is the future of the internet? I found Jorg and Robert uh, talk a little bit about that, but uh, not <coughs> anybody else. So, Lorenzo, please. Well, I think the, the major stake comes from the fact that um, uh, today we are living in a hyper-connected world. It is as a benefit, but also challenges. Because we are in Europe and we are this, this uh, session is about the future of the internet in Europe. I think we should start considering that today the EU in the global ICT competition is lagging behind compared to the dominance of the US ICT industry. We should start from that and should change policies. Only one date. Uh, if uh, we consider the top 25th internet companies by market value only one, the last one, the 25th, is European. We are lagging behind in terms uh, of network infrastructure at LET, the new mobile network. This is for wrong policies. For this reason, we have to now uh, take the opportunity of what's happening today. There is a market that's growing for uh, cloud computing, mobile payment, smart service, city services, internet of things. This requires a Excuse big me. change. Time, one minute. Okay. Oh, you got two. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My fault. My fault. You got it. This uh, requires changes in, uh, in policy along four lines. First of all, in terms of uh, innovation, is innovation is the key. So we need uh, policies much more uh, focused on innovation. Startup programs, only a few of them, uh, focused on 50% uh, should be focused on internet uh, companies and should be on a broad pan-European program. Second, we need a completing the digital single market and we need a change of policy because today the policy at the European level will be much more concerned with reducing prices and not, of, not uh, suggesting and supporting investment. We need also a creation of level playing field with our competitor from the US from the over the top because this is also something that uh, to echo in the first session, uh, even civil society is asking for in terms of privacy rule, for instance. We need also to uh, have a, a more consolidated market because it's clear that uh, today, uh, the, you know, the European place too much, the European uh, Commission, the policy page too much um, uh, emphasis on... Uh, now it's really time. 
I'm sorry. Thomas, over to you. Thank you. Um, to, to answer your question about your disappointment, maybe sh I should inform, uh, we ask them to, uh, from each from a stakeholder from their perspective or their personal experience, to, to give us some, some feeling of what they think, because if we, if we talk European digital societies at stake, there's an underlying assumption that there's something in common in Europe, in, in, in its uh, digital society. And we were basically uh, asking them to, to, to say from their view, what makes European uh, society unique, what, what is different in, in other areas, what do we think is different in other areas, but it also shows that uh, Europe is a, a very heterogeneous thing. We have different actors, something like the European Commission, which is not an, a national government, but it's, not a, it's something that is quite unique to, to Europe. Some countries are member of this structure, others aren't, and so on and so forth. So it's quite a complicated thing. We have uh, um, challenges on, on, on human rights where people, and, and that came out quite clearly in Berlin in the prep meeting, which made it the title that people are and also Mr. Stein, uh, Steinmeier alluded to it, people are afraid that we are losing our values, we are losing things that we used to trust in the past 50 years, um, we are losing power economically, we lose e e efficiency to, to implement and enforce human rights. And the question is how do you recognize each other in, in what your, your colleague said, or do you think um, we haven't touched the point that what can we do in order to save a common vision or common value, if this exists. Do you think it exists or do you think it's, it's a construct and how can we move forward? Yes, uh, Robert, please. Для начала нужно определиться, что есть Европа. To start, let us think, what is Europe? То есть, если это Европейский Союз, то это одна ситуация. Если это э, Европа от Лиссабона до Владивостока, то это совсем другая ситуация. На мой взгляд, не существует как такового цифрового общества. Существует общество в целом и его цифровая составляющая. I also think that there is not such a thing as digital society. There is a society, a general society, and digital is part of it. So, совсем скоро каждый предмет в вашем интерьере будет иметь свой IP-адрес. Very soon, every subject, every object surrounding us will have a chip in it. Сегодня ваш мобильный телефон может следить за вами. Your mobile phone can watch you today. И возникает вопрос, наверное, от этого ощущения незащищенности, наверное, от этого ощущения недоверия. Well, so so И я считаю, что самая главная задача государства в данном случае – это защитить своих граждан. And I think priority number one for a government is to protect citizens. Но как сделать это на международном уровне, потому что интернет это абсолютно трансграничная среда. But how can we do it internationally because internet is transborder? I would cut you short here. I'm sorry. Uh, that, that, that was a comment. Anyone else? Jörg. Um, I think that we do have a common cultural baseline and background, and that is giving us Europeans the opportunity to reunite and to agree on certain values. And I think what is at stake is that we lose momentum in seeking legitimacy globally all over the world. We, as European, given, can give a positive example. We can move on to get things going instead of looking for a endorsed consensus all over the place. We probably need just rough consensus and get something done, develop a solution that uh, is agile, that could be developed further. What, how about 90% solutions? And setting up good examples for anybody else? Ricky. Uh, just one point. Otherwise, what, what would happen is that we would get into a situation where the roots, the common roots we really would need, A, are not set at all, or B, set by somebody. Just think about uh, top over services um, in the global world where data protection, for example, is not respected, is set just by that very companies. Rika? 
Yes, uh, obviously there's huge diversity uh, within Europe, but if we try to focus on some of the commonalities, um, as a matter of fact, we have, we have a human rights system, we have human rights structures in Europe that are comparably very well developed uh, compared to many other places in the world. It's also a fact that at, at the moment, and, and for recent years, we are not really able to, uh, to give practical reality to these values, uh, among other reasons for the, for the nature of the internet and the global information uh, domain that we are in. Um, this is not to say that there are not huge problems with, with human rights protection within Europe, uh, but if we focus on Europe uh, as part of, of the larger picture, um, for example, data protection, the right to privacy is, is a core uh, human rights stipulated uh, in law uh, in Europe. Um, we don't have extraterritorial protection of that right at the moment. It's basically um, dependent on a state protecting its citizen within its own territory. So when the territory is global, we don't have protection mechanisms at the moment uh, that can give that protection to citizens. That's a very concrete uh, problem. Yeah, Thomas. Yeah, Alec. Thank you. Um, I think it's time to invite everybody to join the debate. And uh, we have two mics lines here, so please, uh, this is the ICANN model uh, um, that we took over uh, for resources, so... And we also have this remote participation. <laughs> okay. Um, we are here. This is the panel. We all have nice faces. <laughs> so please, um, take the floor, join the debate. Um, uh, as, as Jörg has already... Uh, uh, before I give the floor to, to Axel, I think this notion of rough consensus that was also a result of the Net Mondial, where people realized there is a broad consensus, but not all governments, not everybody was willing to join a consensus. Is this the solution because we can't implement solutions globally in a UN uh, setting where you have to wait until the last one agrees? Do we need to go for rough consensuses that come from the technical area and try to implement this in a political system as well, Axel, with your experience for, from the technical cooperation with, with the diverse Europe. What is your point on, on this? You're watching my phone. Is it bugged? No. Mm -hmm. um, I have it here. Rough consensus on the running net. Yes. Um, I think, I think the, the problem, oh, the, the fact of life is that, that Europe in itself is already rather diverse. And if you look beyond the, the borders of, of core Europe, it becomes even, even more complicated. And, and, and again, there are many things that are at stake. Uh, if you look at the, at the IETF, um, the Internet Engineering Task Force, for instance, many, many people gl globally coming together and, and fighting for um, safety, security, uh, privacy on the net, permission-free innovation, uh, the end-to-end -end principle. Without that, it, it, it won't work. And I do believe that there are roles for everybody in there and I sort of agree that the digital society is just we, all of us, more or less, in this part of the world at least. So there are roles for everybody and uh, certainly regulators and governments need some help from us occasionally to make good laws and you know, <coughs> blocking and stuff doesn't work so well. On the other hand, speaking for the, for the techies uh, among us, we do need some help with making good operational rules and, and, and policies ourselves and it's good to, to understand what the, what the uh, needs of, of law enforcement are and of, of governments at large. So again, talk to each other and, and, and be tolerant of differing worldviews, but still fight for the net. Oh. Thank you. Um, we have one courageous uh, speaker. Please present yourself and then start. Oksana Prihodka, European Media Platform, Ukraine. I have two very short questions. No, not just one, please. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> no democracy. No, it's, it's, it's well, not. It's Leonid, Russia versus okay. Ukraine. The queue is not that just long, one, Leonid. One, one, if one, if one, she's the only one. one for... Ah, that's okay. the second one, of course. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, not everybody understands uh, the language of value. Maybe we can try to, to use uh, the language of money. Do you have uh, any calculations? What is more profitable to control internet or to govern internet? And no democracy. Yes, we must see what Kalpakom to Pachim, please. And if the big brother is watching us, then who is that big brother? That was the question, huh? 
So, the question of money. Anybody willing to respond? Robert? Вы знаете, есть два слова, на мой взгляд, которые являются ключевыми в той ситуации, которая сейчас происходит. Well, I think there are two key phrases or key words that apply to what's going on. Первое это слово монополия. First is monopoly. Сегодня Соединенные Штаты, хотим мы того или нет, но в данном случае в лице Айкена обладает некоторой монополией в этой области или пытается ее сохранить. Today, whether we want it or not, the United States, represented by Icann, has this monopoly, or maybe trying to preserve it. Второе второе слово это хаос. And the second word is chaos. И в этом смысле мы видим, что вместо прозрачного прозрачного механизма принятия решений, например, такого как такого как голосование, мы говорим о неком раф консенсусе. And uh, instead of uh, transparent and clear-cut mechanisms like uh, making decision or voting, we have to use rough consensus. Человечество имеет немножко больше опыта, чем 20 лет, которые или 40 лет, которые существует интернет. I think humanity is blessed with much longer experience than just the last 20 years of internet development. У нас есть международные институты, у нас есть опыт принятия решений. We have international institutions. We have a lot of experience in decision making. Если мы, например, хотим принимать решения в международной среде, мы не обязательно должны принимать решения консенсусом. Мы можем принимать их большинством. Global level decisions do not have to be taken by full consensus. Simple majority will do. Мы можем реформировать IGF и выбирать туда представителей от разных секторов и делать это в сети. We can go the way of reforming IGF and select representatives from internet providers and other operators. Но если мы не будем этого делать, то мы увидим глобализацию ICANN, фактически глобализацию монополий, которые уже есть. I'm sorry. It's time. It's time. Okay, so Bertrand. Bertrand de la Chapelle. I'm the director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project. I want just to correct one uh, statement or make a remark about a statement that was used and that is used too often in, in meetings, which is the Snowden revelations have made people lose faith in or trust in the Internet. As far as I'm concerned, I have not lose tr lost trust in the Internet. I've lost trust in the behavior of some governments and the capacity of parliamentary oversight to do oversight. That's completely different. That being said, we're talking about digital society and to respond to Mr. Schlegel, of course there is no such thing as the digital society on the one hand and the rest of the society on the other side. The fact is, and the reason why the topic is on the agenda, is because our society is becoming digital in all its dimensions. It is bringing so big transformations that one of the big challenges is precisely how do we prepare, how do we accompany those transitions. We see it in the uh, fate of taxi drivers, and I hope that the position of parliamentarians in general against multi-stakeholderism is not equivalent to the resentment of taxi drivers against Uber. Uh, but what is at stake is today the challenge of finding frameworks to organize the coexistence of different laws in shared online spaces. And we need new frameworks, we need new cooperation mechanisms, because the Thank international you, systems that See, work See, the Swiss is learning fast. This is the Russian way. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Bertrand. I'm sorry. That's good. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, hi, uh, Tatiana Tropina, Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Criminal Law. I have a question to Mr. Schlegel. Uh, as far as I understand, you were expressing the opinion that we need Council of Europe frameworks to regulate the Internet or to govern the Internet. I would like to ask you how this correlates with the fact that, for example, Russia is blocking Council of Europe initiatives on cybercrime and cybersecurity, telling that Council of Europe is not universal enough, not international enough, and it's just a regional organization. And the second fact that Russia was trying to bring this issue on the ITU level, again, for the sake of universality. So how your opinion correlates with this Russian position that Council of Europe is just not international enough? Thank you. 
Спасибо вам за вопрос. Как раз в перерыве мы с моими коллегами, с мистером Франкеном и из Совета Европы разговаривали об этом вопросе. Кибербезопасность – это тема отдельной дискуссии, которая здесь будет. Я думаю, что здесь проблема в том, что у нас не определен, не определены границы суверенитета в сети. Кто-то считает, что суверенитета не существует. Some believe that. Особенно цифрового, если мы говорим о цифровом пространстве. There is no sovereignty in cyberspace. Но, например, Китай так не считает. For example, China is of the camp. К сожалению, если так и дальше будет продолжаться, то у нас будет вместо одного единого интернета много интернетов. So if it goes on like that, very soon uh, we won't have a global net, we'll have a, a set of intranets. И это самая большая угроза. And that's the worst thing that can happen. Uh, если говорить о uh, втором вопросе, to your second question, uh, то, на мой взгляд, парламентская ассамблея Совета Европы или, например, ООН могут быть инструментами для создания правовой основы. Но они не должны управлять интернетом. But they should not have hands on the government. В этой сфере может быть новый мандат у IGF, может быть новая организация, что-то может быть у ICANN, но мы должны все вместе договориться и прописать конкретно, что есть что, какие обязанности, какие стороны за что отвечают, и это должна быть максимально прозрачная, прозрачный документ, максимально прозрачная точка принятия решений. Спасибо. One of the existing bodies, uh, uh, like ICANN or uh, like organizations, uh, can uh, get uh, such a function. But before they do that, we need to get together and write down in detail who is responsible for what. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Christina from the Commission yes, wanted to Just in reaction add a to some comments from the audience, I would like to say that indeed the Snowden revelations have been a wake up call for. Europe, so there is a problem and we need to fix it. And uh, I just wanted to point out that the European Union, in addition to our communication where we propose some concrete actions uh, and commitments that of course we would be ready to uh, uh, realize together with the rest of the stakeholders because we are not alone in this, we are uh, working on the European Union front on several areas. Also, I listened to uh, the concerns of um, a European industry representative that we are lagging behind. But we are, we are doing our bit. We are now um, working on the Connected Continent proposal, uh, which uh, um, aims at making the digital single market in Europe a reality. We um, are working now on the revision of privacy and personal data protection framework and also the directive on network and information security. So we are doing our bit in Europe and I think also this is the added value we can, we can bring to the global debate. Um, we are here at Fora like Eurodig because it's important to listen to the input provided by all stakeholders, also the technical community. Um, at the same time, we cannot aim to have the same rules. So, I mean, in Europe we, we are advancing. It's, it's uh, painful sometimes because it's a complicated process, but we are, we are trying to do this and we, we need the support of, uh, of all stakeholders for that. On the international front, instead, of course, we Excuse cannot me. have the same rules, I'm but sorry. at least I'm some sorry. level of I'm interoperability. Sorry. I have That's to it. cut you short. Paul, do we have any uh, remote participants uh, with their questions? I'm sorry? If you just... Uh, Yes, um, there was actually one question on Twitter or two. Um, one question by Ellen Broad from IFLA. Um, the EU has a strong human rights framework. So how to reconcile this with regulations that can restrict these freedoms such as intellectual property rights? That was one question on the Twitter wall. And another, one, another question was related to cybersecurity. To what extent is this debate on internet governance and shared values related to or interfacing with the debate on cybersecurity? 
cybersecurity aside, uh, let me just one quick thought. Just one question relevant to our discussion throughout Europe. Does it mean that we are all in this room the only participants of our own show and nobody cares, nobody else cares in Europe? Thank you. Okay. Uh, just uh, uh, Lorenzo wanted to take the floor and maybe we, we have talk, uh, uh, talked a lot about human rights but uh, the word monopoly ha has been mentioned and of course it is one thing and this is also linked to, to the fears of economic downturn in Europe if we are all using uh, services from other continents because they are so good, so efficient and so comfortable and we are not uh, seeing progress or innovation enough in, in European industry is that it, does that become a challenge to our human rights system as well? And what can we do? Or what, you already made some points. How do we overcome this problem that, that uh, the European industry is not as visible and not as used as it could be? Uh, well, uh, I will answer to that. I, um, I want to also go back to the question that was uh, asked by Bertrand. In other words, uh, uh, the transactional nature of the internet requires definitely a new framework. Okay, but we have to make clear that there are regional issues and global issues. I would say, for instance, privacy, I do consider privacy a, a regional issues because, you know, we have basically difference between the Europe and the United States. In Europe, we defend, we consider privacy why uh, citizen. In, in the U.S., instead, uh, uh, there is the prevalence to consider citizen consumer to some extent. And so, we are uh, uh, strongly supporting the uh, change of law regarding privacy in, the, in Europe because we think that uh, European consumers, wherever they are in Europe, should be, no matter which company is offering them service, should be treated in the same, in the same way. Okay? So this does mean that because the servers are outside Europe, they should be protected as the European law requires. But on, on uh, other issues, like for instance, cybersecurity, probably we need a, a different approach. The best uh, way is to have this right combination between soft law and hard law. And so here comes, although we don't think in detail about cybersecurity, the issue may be or hard law to approach also cybersecurity, like international treaty. But it's I'm sorry. a different matter. I'm sorry. Please. Uh, oh, there was a question. Yeah, please. Introduce yourself. Dmitry Kochmanyuk, uh, Dmitry Kochmanyuk, uh, Hostmaster Ukraine and uh, representative on the NRO speaking in personal capacity. I heard something, I think Robert said that, and it actually made me feel alarmed about the United States having monopoly in the internet. But the question is probably to all of the members of the panel. I don't think the statement is any way true. Because last time I checked and the subback bone is gone, Russia operates dot Moscow and dot RU and dot RF TLDs. Amsterdam based RIPNCC allocates IP addresses and pretty much all of the players in the internet are not controlled by US government. In fact, even United Nations headquarters are located in the United States, but somehow we don't think United States has monopoly in United Nations. So does anybody here actually feel that the United States government has a final say on what they can or cannot do? Does they feel that the United States has control over their businesses? Because if it's an elephant in the room, I want to know its shape. So now it's come, the, the moment of truth. At the uh, Eurodeek, <laughs> we are discussing the United States. <laughs> what a sad story. Anyway. Uh, uh, Я хотел бы адресовать этот вопрос Леониду, потому что он является, собственно, членом некоммерческой организации и занимается в том числе управлением доменными зонами .ru и .rf. Это не правительственная организация. I would like to readdress this question to Leonid because he comes from an NGO which governs domains .ru and .rf. Это месть Леониду за то, что он ограничивает нас во времени. This is my revenge for Leonid for cutting us off so soon. I'm a Russian, I'm smart enough. So let me pass this question to a colleague of mine from Denik. <laughs> so, moment of truth uh, for Dati Now, Well, uh, for me, if you're referring to, for example, the, the role of the US government in the IANA, uh, then I think the IANA function has a very limited role. So I would certainly agree to, to what you said before. There's no, 
drastic control of the internet by the US government from my point of view. On the other hand, and now we're, we're coming back to the Snowden renovations, um, there had been some um, misuse and some control that was probably unlawful. We, we just do not know that, and American citizens do not know that either. Um, but that is the thing where control is put into action, put into place. But we are not talking about this kind of control. Thank you. Um, we have another uh, voice from the floor. <clears throat> you are Leonin from the University of Helsinki, speaking here as a young person. I claim that we, the youth, are the main user group, at least a very distinct one. We are the ones that are building the societal form of the web. Still too often we feel oppressed and not a being able to change the digital life we have built. Digital society is at stake if we, the youth, the pioneers, are not heard. How to firmly establish our stakeholder position? Thank you. Good question. Ricky, you want to answer? This civil society have no word on this. Okay, the youngest person, I'm sorry, the youngest person on the panel. Я думаю, что скажу страшную вещь. I'm going to say a horrible thing. Сегодня в России, например, практически у каждого человека есть мобильный телефон, и практически каждый человек в не только молодой, но и в зрелом возрасте пользуется интернетом. Well, almost uh, everyone in Russia, uh, young and not so young, has a mobile phone, and practically everyone uses internet. My mom is much older than me, but she also uses the internet every day. My mom comes from an older generation, but she is a daily user of internet. And I think that there is no such stakeholder as the young. There are just young people who are которые ну, обладают определенными специфическими э, навыками, специфическими свойствами, но такого стейкхолдера не существует, на мой взгляд. I don't think we can single out the youth as a separate stakeholder. There is no such thing. Yes, there are young people who are internet users, but they are just part of the population. Потому что если мы защищаем права человека в сети, то мы должны защищать права каждого человека, вне зависимости от того, какого он пола, какого он возраста, какого он вероисповедания и где он живет. Спасибо. If we set out to protect human rights on the web, we should do it regardless of the sex, of age and other characteristics they may have. Good ace up in the sleeve. That's a good job for a law lawmaker. Uh, we have a question from our remote participant. Yes, another question, um, this time from a remote hub in Kiev in Ukraine. Um, are we actually right now discussing the implementation of the net mundial principles on a local or regional level? And if this is the case, what would be the procedures um, to do so? Does anybody on the panel want to, maybe the commission or... or what are you doing with net mundial, yes, with the outcome? Well, just to say that... Uh, we think it was a, a, a good uh, moment, Net Mundial. It was a successful uh, step of multi stakeholderism. Of course, there are things which can be improved, but overall, it was positive. And we think that uh, overall, uh, it is in line with uh, what we also put forward in our communication. Now we need to be uh, practical, so we are assessing uh, the way ahead. Uh, for us, it's very important to uh, be concrete about the strengthening of the IGF and of fora like Eurodig. And for this also, it's important that also European uh, industry uh, and other stakeholders support also financially and non-financially this kind of, of uh, platforms because they, I mean, without the IGF, it would have been difficult to have a net mundial experience, for instance. Um, and then, of course, we want to go on with the um, uh, globalization of uh, ICANN and YANA. So we are, you know, trying to push the process forward. Um, and then there are other of, of, uh, of proposals. Uh, for instance, also one important contribution we, we would like to, to give is the launch of the Global Internet Policy Observatory. 
uh, as a tool for the global community to advance uh, our, our uh, common agreement on, on topics and, and be able to discuss with all stakeholders because there is a problem sometimes uh, many participants in, in, in the process feel uh, disengaged or excluded because uh, the process is so complex and sometimes um, uh, it's difficult also to understand the added value of multi-stakeholderism. That's why we need to uh, have tools to understand the issues uh, and, and facilitate uh, things. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. So the IGF Secretariat now can uh, sleep well. So the European Commission has just committed to uh, sort of uh, help financially. We have always uh, uh, That's good. supported no, 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 the no, no, IGF. No. We I invite know. the industry also That's to good. do that. That's good. Thank you. Uh, Ricky. Uh, well, Ricky, I guess. Huh? Ricky is waiting for quite some time, and then I think we take... I think uh, one very concrete thing that uh, the European uh, states, governments, as well as industry could do was to to turn this human rights commitment into something that's much more practical. We recently had the first, one of the first privacy judgments from the European Court of Justice related to data protection and the data retention regime. That is an example of a widely deployed practice across Europe where you now have a court ruling stating that data retention can be a legitimate mean to fight cyber crime. However, in the current way it's implemented, it is not. It is a clear violation of privacy rights. How many other examples of that do we have across Europe that have never been tested before a court? And here I think uh, European states with their strong uh, human rights tradition could really show the way by voluntarily <coughs> have key internet policy legislation and practice undergo um, independent human rights assessment for their implications. That's a good story. Uh, yes, please. Uh, my name is Johannes. I was a participant of the New Media Summer School, a group of young people who is talking since Sunday about the internet. And I have a question about something Lorenzo said in his first statement. He talked about innovation and I want to link innovation with access to the internet for the people because I think most of the time it is linked. I want to know your point uh, to see net neutrality um, because when we don't, will not have net neutrality, we will not have lots of innovation because we, small businesses and startups will not have the possibility. And I want to know what is your point to, uh, that the access to the internet should be a service for the public so that we can save innovation and participation, particip participation of everyone. Thank you. So we have Lorenzo and then Robert, okay. and then York. Okay. okay. Thank you for this question. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, it's important, especially for uh, young people, um, when, uh, to understand this, when we look at the net neutrality, we should avoid the mistake, the, the especially uh, politicians uh, or policy makers sometimes make, to look at the, net, at the future of the internet with the eye of the past. Okay. Uh, in other words, uh, when uh, internet, uh, internet today is something completely different from what it used to be, okay? And uh, we should uh, uh, understand there is a, a great variety in terms of people, in terms of application. In other words, years ago, the only application available basically were, were uh, uh, surfing the net and email. Now we have a totally uh, completely new set of application and we, we should be uh, we should strive to keep open the internet as the message is coming from net mundial but allow also for company for consumer to use new services without discriminating That's okay. thank you i'm sorry so robert uh, one thing is that i have supported my uh, it's okay, colleague. But, uh, okay thank so, you. so just in support okay, okay. york well, I'd like to combine the answer to that question with reference to net neutrality to the question we had before, should we implement values? And my vicious answer would be yes, we should. Uh, the problem or the challenge about that is um, everybody could agree to a certain value, let's say, for example, privacy. Uh, but if, you, if we go down a little bit more into detail, then it becomes complicated. For example, the net mondial statement points out you shouldn't be under privacy, you shouldn't be subject to unlawful or arbitrary surveillance. 
So what does that mean? So what we really do have to do is we have to agree on something that is really effectuatable. And there's the problem. And with respect to net neutrality, for example, this is clearly the reason before, because net neutrality hasn't found its way into the net mundial statement. It's just not there because we couldn't even agree on this very abstract term. And it's going to get a lot harder to fill in and to be very concrete about all these values. And that's what lay in, in front of us. Uh, a very quick comment from Robert, because we need to take another question. No, okay, please. Uh, Claudia Sally at TNT. Uh, I have actually a question for the European Commission. Uh, Christina, in your remarks you say that uh, many are rejecting the multi-stakeholder approach and that there is a need for a new uh, model of governance. I was curious to know what is the Commission doing to address this, uh, this issue? I don't know whether you already responded a little bit to this question before, but maybe if you can elaborate a little more. Thank you. May I? Yes. Uh, well, indeed, I mean, we see that there is a discontent uh, on the current uh, uh, way the Internet is, is managed. And um, many, many uh, countries are opting for what we could say the easy solution that is governmental control. And we think that part of the problem is due to the complexity of the institutional framework and of the different range of topics covered by internet governance. So, for us, the, the, the response, part of the solution is uh, maybe, two, maybe twofold. First of all, reaching out. We need to involve all stakeholders, reaching also out to those countries, understand their concerns, because they are legitimate concerns. And uh, so this is first, uh, uh, first aspect. And the second aspect is uh, capacity building. Um, many um, of these go countries, but not just at governmental level, are lacking the expertise um, to really follow and understand all the different uh, um, uh, in impacts and repercussions. So also here, uh, capacity building is crucial. So we have a number of programs also to, uh, to do that. And again, maybe I mentioned before the Global Internet uh, Policy Observatory, which is an initiative we are trying to make a reality together with other uh, players. And we think this is a, a useful uh, contribution. And later today, I will be uh, talking about it in a flash session. So. If uh, somebody is interested, I will be happy to, to give more details. Yes. Um, this issue raised by, uh, by Sally, also the, the European Commission, um, requires, I think, a little bit of a deepening. Um, even in the Net Mundial document, at the end, the question opened, there was this idea of, uh, although we all uh, uh, support strongly the multi-stakeholder approach. We need to understand that there are, uh, there is it's open a debate on the different uh, role among the stakeholders and when, uh, when the equal footing start, when finish. I think that this is a real issue, need to be addressed. And I think we should probably also move forward, uh, try to understand that we should try the way, even the mechanisms, to allow let's say, one phase of discussion that is equal foot in which uh, all the major components discuss what to do. But then, when we go on the operational side, probably one of the players, for instance, on uh, human rights, the state, or on uh, technical issues, uh, uh, the private sector, or other issues, the civil society, should take the lead. We call this the multi-stakeholder model with variable geometry. In other words, we should try to allow also this differentiation. It's something, by the way, I invite all of you to come to the IGF to Istanbul because we have, a, uh, we have a workshop on that. That's good. Robert? Yeah. Um, I came to Brazil with a lot of hope that uh, it will be мероприятие, которое во многом расставит точки над и. Well, I went to Brazil with very high expectations, hoping to see all the eyes, uh, all the T's uh, crossed and eyes dotted. Но, к сожалению, я увидел ситуацию, когда организаторы этого мероприятия пытались любой ценой, любым способом, на мой взгляд, протащить некий документ, который был согласован заранее. И именно, наверное, поэтому там нет э, слов о нейтральности. 
But uh, uh, what I was faced with uh, the uh, attempts of the organizers at any price to push ahead with the document which uh, had been probably pre prepared, uh, and that is probably why it didn't contain net neutrality. Internet is a huge space, and it's also a very uh, Internet is a huge space, and it's also a very uh, appetizing piece. И бюрократия, которая на первом этапе появилась э, вокруг э, сети. That, uh, was, uh, at, at, at как и любая бюрократия пытается э, разрастись, пытается увеличиться. Поэтому мы видим, как вот почкованием размножается ICANN. That, that's why we see я думаю, что э, развитие управления интернетом возможно в рамках существующих институтов. И на мой взгляд, это очень важно. I do believe internet governance Time. is possible in the existing framework. Uh, и тому пример IGF, и это, кстати, есть в NetMundiale, в принципах NetMundiale, пересмотр формата IGF, новые полномочия IGF. Спасибо. And IGF is a very good case in point, and by the way, that's laid down in the NetMundiale documents. So we have another three questions to go, thank you. We have another three questions starting from the left. Please. Uh, thank you. My name is Bernhard Heiden. I'm from the Young Pirates of Europe, and I would like to ask a question to the representative of the European Commission, uh, mainly, uh, and it's about the um, usage of the, the term single digital mar uh, European market um, in this discussion, and I would like to frame it a little bit else um, uh, when it comes to infrastructure. We see that in uh, Europe, most of the national um, infrastructure providers are already owned by uh, multinational corporations and um, have the, U um, the U.S. as a um, uh, example where a unified market um, um, brings us a, a very low standard on infrastructure whilst uh, maintaining So the prices. question is? The, the question is how uh, would the European Commission like to uh, ensure that um, a European digital single market will not make us, uh, in, bring us an ol oligopoly in Europe when it comes to infrastructure? Yes. Um, well, the, mm, the package is currently uh, under discussion, so uh, the Commission made a proposal which was a, a revision of a previous framework, and now the final shape that it will have, it will be defined by the European Parliament and the Council. So, we still don't know how the final uh, play will be, but for sure, the aim of the package is to make sure that we have a unified single market uh, also for the users to be able to, uh, for instance, uh, use their phone freely if they move from one country to another, being able to use their services and choose their providers independently of a specific country where they are. So this is the main idea behind uh, the package. Um, and of course, also part of it is to ensure that every European citizens can fully enjoy the benefits of the digital world, so that means high connectivity. Um, now the package is under discussion and, uh, and it will become uh, low and we hope uh, by the end of the year. Thank you. Next question, please. Introduce yourself. Uh, uh, th thank you for the panel and thank you for the audience. Uh, my name is Christo Helas, I come from uh, Finnish frontier of, uh, elephant frontier of Finland. I would like to ask you, uh, regarding the recent events in, in the, uh, some hostile gover governments uh, violating the privacy rights of the, of the citizens, uh, do you see that the new global internet governance systems and models should be built uh, more to protect the citizens uh, of the ho from the hostile governments or other ways around? Thank you. Rike, I think it's, it's, it's in your department, isn't it? A global protection of the right of privacy is, is really one of the very major challenges, I think, right now in, the, in, the, in, in securing that, that human rights are actually protected in the global domain. We had the first uh, resolution on the right to privacy in the digital age at the General Assembly. That was an important step forward, but nevertheless, it's just a resolution. So I think there are, there are some things that are, that are way overdue. Uh, one is, for example, that 
the general comment to Article 17 of the International Covenant that stipulates the right to privacy that, that most states in the world are subject to. There's a general comment which is basically a, a guideline to national courts on how to interpret this right and how to interpret the state obligation. That general comment dates back to, uh, I think, 88. Uh, and it has been suggested for many years, um, also by the UN Special Rapporteur on, on um, the fight against terrorism in, in the light of human rights march in China, that this general comment should be revised so that some of all the challenges we see at the moment are actually addressed. So that you go in at a much more concrete level and say the challenge that we have, for instance, with privacy violations occurring outside the state territory, how is that? How are we to deal with that? Um, are states bound by the right to privacy, not only regarding their own citizens, but to all the communications that takes place within their territory? So, concretely, the Snowden case, for instance, um, what are the US state obligations under sorry, this Richard. international covenant? So there are a number of, of measures that could be taken and could be advanced. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last question from the floor. Okay. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, John Carr from the European NGO Alliance for Child Safety Online. Uh, I don't know if this is a question just to Robert or to the panel as a whole, but he, he said um, that he didn't think young people should be regarded as being a separate or different interest in these discussions around internet governance and internet policy generally. I suppose it depends on your definition of a young person, but I wonder if he acknowledges and accepts that every country in Europe, indeed every country in the world except for three, are signatories to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which creates obligations on states to make special provisions to protect, ch to protect children. That means people under the age of 18, and the internet has not got an exemption from that convention. I wonder if you could comment on that. Anyone ready? Robert? Я думаю, что здесь в ответ очевиден, мы должны защищать права детей. Мы должны делать это на всех уровнях, как на уровне национального законодательства, так и на уровне международного законодательства. В России это происходит. И здесь очень важно, я согласен с вами по поводу того, что очень важно определить, какие вопросы и каким образом государство ведет себя на региональном уровне, а как оно ведет себя на глобальном уровне. There's no arguing about it. Uh, our children's uh, rights should be protected full stop. And uh, we are doing that at the national level, and it's done at the international level. Russia is doing uh, its homework. Of course, you're right in pointing out that it is necessary to uh, point out, to um, uh, define uh, what are exactly the rights of persons under 18. But, you know, this какое-то удивительное, ну, что ли, лицемерие, когда мы имеем дело с, э, с нарушением прав миллионов, сотен миллионов пользователей э, сети, и мы не стремимся к тому, чтобы сейчас же прекратить это нарушение. Мы рассуждаем в целом, что нам делать, когда, и так уже течет достаточно э, долго этот процесс. Well, there, there's uh, still a lot of hypocrisy about protecting human rights online because there are hundreds uh, of uh, people and uh, many groups of people whose, whose rights are infringed online, but we're not crying out, stop it right now. But children should be the first priority. Thank you. The last question. Um, we the very last. are approaching, or actually at uh, one o'clock, so we will take one last intervention from the floor. Please let me remind you um, that we have a new format this year, because um, as an experimental reaction, trying to accommodate the wish that normally um, there's not enough time to go into details in, in the sessions, and that it might be useful to, to distill the few key elements or some key elements in another session, which we now I've decided to, 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 uh, to make this experiment here in, in Berlin. There will be one breakout session this afternoon in parallel to the workshops um, <clears throat> that will be held uh, from 2.30 to 4. There will be another breakout session tomorrow. The, the breakout session today is an opportunity to continue and discuss 
what we've uh, had this, uh, what, what we discussed in the first opening plenary, net mondial, multi-stakeholderism, and also this plenary about uh, European society at stake and what is the common vision, how to, to uh, try and develop European uh, societies and, and, and standards and principles forward. So uh, the last intervention yeah, before I'm sorry. the lunch. After the last question and after the last answer, I will um, uh, pass the, uh, the mic to Wolf for some announcement as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, very quick. Just uh, my name is Dimitris Nikolski. I represent the Committee of Experts on the People on the Rights of People with Disabilities and the Council of Europe. I just like to say that one of the main things that I kept from this session is the word human rights. So very quick, to, I'd like to add you uh, how you connect the human rights, as everybody said, with the access uh, of the people with disability to increase the, the access on the internet. There is a digital gap between uh, the normal people, let's say, and the disabled people. And uh, I'd like to ask the European uh, Union, the Commission, and maybe the Council of Europe as well. Uh, what are the efforts that you do uh, to your member states in order to increase the accessibility uh, for the people of the disabled, of the disabled people on the internet? Uh, thank you. Well, very briefly, of course, it is an important aspect, and we keep it in mind. And. Uh, Maybe I'm not the right person to provide an answer to this specific question and maybe the technical community can, uh, can be uh, more helpful. But for sure it is, it is uh, one of the priorities which is in, on our communication as well. So it is mentioned. Um, how we are going to do it in practice, I'm not the right person to answer to that question. Uh, but maybe I, will, I, can, I can get back to you at a later stage or maybe some of the other panelists will be already able to provide uh, an answer. Robert? Спасибо за вопрос. Thank you very much for your question. На мой взгляд, он очень важный. I think it's a crucial question. Это вопрос того, что в интернете есть и может быть у людей больше прав, чем это принято, например, в рамках декларации о правах человека. Well, uh, it may be that in the realm of internet, people have more rights than in the sense of uh, universal declaration of human rights. Ну, например, право на забвение. For example, the right to forget. Uh, to be forgotten. <laughs> to be forgotten. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> И то же самое касается людей с ограниченными возможностями. Мы можем создать условия, когда, и это можно прописать в международном праве, что, например, государственные сайты обязаны, как это, например, происходит в России, иметь специальные приложения или специальные страницы для тех людей, кто плохо видит или не слышит. We may create preferential conditions for users with disabilities. And as it is happening in Russia, for example, we mandate every uh, government site to have special applications for people with disabilities. Возможны также программы субсидирования технологий для инвалидов. Internet, внедрение интернет-технологий для инвалидов. Well, governments can sponsor or fund extra uh, special uh, software for uh, people with disabilities. Здесь все в наших руках. Спасибо. So it's all in our hands. Rike wanted to make a short, quick statement before we break for lunch. Yeah, just a, a final remark in, in relation to the question. There is no... I mean, there's no doubt that access is, is access to the internet, uh, access to content is, is really crucial uh, and, and an important uh, prerequisite for, for enjoying human rights online. It goes for people with disability, but it also goes for tons of other groups. Uh, there are so many uh, inequalities related to, to gender, to regions, to poverty, to all kinds. Of, I mean, there are tons of of different ways you can draw lines of, of lack of, of access uh, for various reasons. And yes, it is, it's a very, very crucial element. So, we're done. Uh, I mean, the panel's over. I just want to thank our panelists. I mean, they were great. Thank you very much. I want to thank Thomas and Paul and all those who asked those questions. 
And a quick uh, announcement from uh, the organizers. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Leonid and uh, Thomas and uh, panelists. Before we let you go into uh, your deserved lunch break, uh, some short housekeeping announcements. As uh, Thomas indicated already, after the lunch break, we will continue with the four, our four first workshops, including the breakout session for these plenaries. There will be several sub-issues, questions, which were raised by the audience. For example, accessibility fits perfectly into workshop two. So you will have plenty of opportunities after the break to continue these kind of discussions. Now, lunch is served on this side and on the other side. So if you want to avoid long queues, don't run out all here, so share a bit the exits and you will have enough space. We wish all of you good appetite and please try to be back punctually in time after the lunch break. Thanks. <laughs>